hundreds of thousands of Czechoslovaks are in the streets. After 40 years, the students here resign, resign, they demanded. The galactic communism at the center of Europe, they returned to Europe. To Europe, or in Czechoslovakia today became the latest of the countries of Eastern Europe to throw off its hardline communist yoke. The national divorce can be peaceful. Czechoslovakia split into the Czech Republic and Slovakia. On the 1st of May 2004, 10 new countries joined the EU. Enlargement boosted gross and improved uh, living standards. It has to be freedom. 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 Global security is an objective for all humanity. I wanted to show with my colleagues and with my friends that we can do things that are recognizable. It has permitted us to discuss such important issues as democracy, freedom, human rights, and how all of those fit, not just in the present, but very importantly, how they'll fit into the future. Hope, optimism, exaltation. Literally a first-class global pipe operation. Gentlemen, dear friends, uh, my name is Robert Rush, and I'm the founder of the Globsec Forum and the executive vice president of the Central European Strategy Council, which organizes this conference. And it is my pleasure to welcome you on this conference uh, for the 10th time. And I'm very glad that for the second time uh, we have decided to move the debates out of the Hotel Kempinski. And we decided not to be just a traditional conference beyond the walls and beyond the, the negotiation walls of the main conference hall, but we wanted to bring the best debates and speakers to the Bratislava citizens, to the broader public, because we think it is very important that we discuss uh, international security, that we care about international security, international affairs. We have to define in what kind of Europe we want to live in. And it is even more important than ever before because Europe is tested on many fronts, um, on the stability of Ukraine, tensions uh, with Russia, new wave of immigrants from the south, but also internal tensions within the European Union, whether we call the acronyms of Brexit and Grexit. These all issues are defining our way of life and will be defining the institutions that are creating and preserving our way of life for the upcoming decade. So it is, I'm very glad that we've been able to put this together with the city of Bratislava, uh, with the great mayor, who has helped us in organizing this event here. We already kicked off the conference in the Hotel Kempinski in the morning with the great speech of David Cameron, the prime minister. Right now there is a, a, a panel of prime ministers of Visegrad 4, and we are going on tomorrow and after tomorrow. But I know that the program here will be especially uh, interesting as well. We have introduced a new format with Nick going Oxford style debate because we don't want to be traditional. We want a really live and lively debate and I hope you will enjoy it and you will be part of that debate. So with this let me thank you once again that you found time to come here to be part of the debates on international uh, policy and I hope you will be able to meet one of many of the leading persons who are, uh, who are influencing the international policy. Thank you very much, and let me pass the floor to the mayor of uh, Bratislava, Ivo Nesarovnal. Thank you. Thank you. Well, well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, Robert, uh, dear friends. Let me welcome you to Bratislava. Thank you for coming to our city, for showing interest in discussion, in discussing issues and things which uh, on its face go beyond our daily life, our daily business, 
but in their essence are substantial to our lives. Thank you to the panelists for taking part in this event, in this discussion. Uh, I'm sure that the panelists will provoke uh, inspiring and vivid discussion. The auditorium listeners in Bratislava are very demanding, so I look forward to that discussion. Globsec is uh, already taking deep roots in Bratislava. It's becoming a tradition, and I'm glad that our city is the house of this event because year to year we face an increase in quality and in international reputation and relevance. And I especially appreciate that because in Bratislava, as you might know, or Bratislava, this city has been for a long, long time, for over 40 years, a frontier city, a city on an iron curtain. And we were exposed literally daily to the Iron Curtain, to divisions, to defense, to what the German call Stacheldraht, to shootings, to terror, and to death. And therefore, now, as a free nation, as a member of EU and NATO, we will always stand at the side of those deprived, humiliated, and imperished. And I guess I believe that a discussion, a free discussion, is a very powerful tool how to prevent again happening of, of take raising offenses and new divisions in Europe, especially today, nowadays, when we see and face and have to deal with nations losing their territory in violation of international law, when we see and face our neighbor nations being deprived of their right to speak for their future and to choose their future freely. And uh, we shall not be afraid of raising these issues. We shall not be afraid of taking this to the public because fear is a bad advisor. And in this part of Europe, we know a lot about fear and its tragic consequences. We shall not be afraid because if we are afraid, those who fear nothing will come and they will call the shots. And I don't know about you, but for me, I don't want to see it happening in my country again. So, and this is one of the reasons we are here today. I, as a mayor of uh, Bratislava, will always seek to keep this city open to the world, connected with the world, open to the ideas how to improve our lives, because then we see new opportunities and, of course, new friendships. So friends, uh, I hope and I wish you a vivid, inspiring uh, discussion with uh, brilliant minds and uh, have a wonderful time in Bratislava. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And let me invite the panelists and Nick Gowing to lead the next debate. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Edward, come and sit here. George at the end. And Ivan and Evgeny here. I'm going to ask you, if I may, can we have some lights on uh, for the audience, both here and a large number who are sitting on the balcony? Then we know who we're talking to. And there are quite a lot of empty seats here, Michal, if you want to uh, ask others. Uh, I can see people up there. Now, I'm going to explain what all this is about in a moment, but can I just say, having heard the mayor and also Robert, I remember Bratislava in the dark days when I was accredited in Czechoslovakia, and uh, I came here escaping your secret police in order to uh, see people like Mr. Dubček. And so uh, I, like Edward, who was here at the time, uh, we didn't actually meet here. I remember when Bratislava was uh, a place which was cut off when I couldn't get here uh, through um, the border because there was the pink um, border post and they never let me through. So coming through on the six-lane motorway today, as last year, is still quite something for someone like me. I remember those dark days, um, and I think Edward does as well. So uh, I am delighted that I can share 
uh, this move forward in terms of uh, democracy, open speech, open thought, open views, and often difficult views in this kind of environment. It's tremendous. Now, the first thing I need to check is, have you all voted? Because um, uh, this is important as part of what I'm going to explain. Have all of you up there somehow cast a vote or not? No. Yes, all right. I, I can't see anybody up there, but are there some people who haven't voted? The reason is, what we're going to do over the next hour and a half is try and find out how those for the motion, those against the motion, have managed to persuade you to change your view, if at all. And so I need to know what view you have, because you've actually put one of the slips, you should still have a second slip, in one of the boxes, for or against the motion. And just in case you're not sure why you've come here tonight and what the motion is, I'm going to read it. This is known as an Oxford-style debate, although these kind of debates do go on in other parts of, the, of Britain and elsewhere, but it is known as an Oxford-style debate where my job, frankly, is to just keep discipline and order between the two who are going to propose the motion and the two who are against the motion. Um, and the motion is that NATO and EU member states in Western Europe must assume Russia will work to subvert them, including using military force. Now, the way this is going to work is that I, if you have all voted, and if you haven't, um, if there's a way, Michal, for there, anyone to put a piece of paper in a box, this isn't a gimmick. It's designed to work out how speeches from here of eight minutes and six minutes each can actually persuade you there is another side to an argument. This is something I've done for Intelligence Squared on BBC World News, for whom I don't work anymore. Um, uh, but you, some of you may have seen this. And now we bring it to Bratislava as a different way of airing some of the very complex but very sharp issues that have to be debated at Globsec between now and Sunday afternoon. So it's, a quite a, it's a kind of a formal debate. We are going to hear uh, from two proposers and two uh, uh, opponents. The two proposers are led by Edward, who will speak for eight minutes, then George, who will speak for six minutes. Uh, against the motion will be Ivan, who will speak for eight minutes. He will speak second. And then Evgeny, at the end, uh, will speak for another six minutes. Then I'll open it to you. We have microphones. I want to hear you making an argument, not, ask, not necessarily asking questions. My job is to keep time, and it'll be up for a maximum of one minute. We will try and finish at 6.20. And before that, each of the speakers here will have two minutes to sum up. And it's going to go in reverse order. Uh, Evgeny will speak first against the motion. George will speak second. Ivan will speak third. And Ed will wind up responding. And as we do these winding up uh, remarks, I will ask you to use your second of these slips to put in the boxes which are going to go around so that I have an idea within about 10 minutes of what the percentage is and whether there's been a shift at all in your views. So please, don't leave before 6.20, because that will begin to distort the numbers and the percentages. Um, and um, I say that in all seriousness, because I think this could be quite, um, quite delicately poised. So um, what I'm going to ask each of them now to do in 30 seconds, first of all, is introduce themselves, and frankly, to explain why they're on the platform. Ed. Good evening, everybody. I am the Senior Vice President at SEPA, which is a think tank in Washington and in Warsaw. Um, I've been writing about this region for more than 30 years, and I was indeed the, I was the only English-speaking correspondent in uh, what was then Czechoslovakia before the revolution. It's very nice to be back. I've been coming to Globsec for many years. Ivan. One moment. Is the microphone working? Uh, can you hear? One moment. Microphone, please. This is why I'm doing it, actually. Could, could you hear me? Yes, that was fine. Not quite. This is why I'm testing. Try sh shouting. I'll tell you what, Evgeny, give us your background. One moment. You're going to have to be smarter on the microphone, please. Mm -hmm. OK. No, OK, no. right. Ivan, 30 seconds on you. OK, thanks. Well, 
the one. I'm from Moscow. I work for Russian International Affairs Council. I'm a director of program there. Uh, and REAC, Russian International Affairs Council, uh, is a think tank dealing with uh, international affairs and foreign policy of Russia. And I am responsible for the intellectual performance of the council, responsible for its programs and projects. Thank you very much indeed. George. My name is George. My name's George Friedman. I'm the founder of Strat4 from Austin, Texas. Strat4 is a private intelligence company. And uh, I was born not too far from here in Budapest. Thank you, George. Finally, Evgeny. My name is Evgeny. One moment. Microphone. Shoot. Sure. No, something. Uh, my name is Evgeny Nadoshin. I am chief economist at a small consultancy firm, uh, PF Capital, in Moscow. I used to work as an advisor to the Minister of Economic Development for a number of years, I, and uh, in different other business in, in different business units in the Russian Federation. And mostly, my pre mo preoccupation is mostly economics. So I, I do what I do. So not political, not political studies, nothing like that. Only economics. Evgeny, thank you very much indeed. We've now tested the microphones as well. Uh, you know who is now sitting on the platform. I'm going to ask once again, has everyone who wants to vote voted at the moment? Good. No one has said no. That's good. Right. Someone is now going to count this. Uh, I don't know where Michal has gone. I hope he's now. You're going to count these now. Because what I'm going to do is I will get past the percentages during the discussion, but I'm not going to tell you the way you have voted. So let's start the debate. Uh, the debate is NATO and EU members states in Western Europe must assume Russia will work to subvert them, including using military force. I'm opening the floor now, and Ed, you have eight minutes to make the case. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Nick, and thanks to the organisers for hosting this. The fact we are discussing this at all is a tragedy. This is not what we wanted in 1989. It's not what we wanted in 1991. It's not what we wanted all through the 1990s. We wanted Russia to be part of the West, like Japan, but even more so. The West is a geographical um, entity only in part. It's much more a community of shared values and idea of a rules-based world with good governance and a commitment to mutual prosperity and security. And I think it's the great, whereas the great joy of my lifetime was that the evil empire collapsed, the great tragedy of my lifetime is the way in which Russia has been hijacked. But we have to be realistic about this. The era of wishful thinking is over. We are no longer in the position we were in 1997 when we signed the NATO-Russia Founding Act. We're no longer in the position we were in Rome um, in 2002. We're dealing with a Russia which does not like the European security order. It actively dislikes it and wants to subvert it. It thinks that this is hypocritical, it's unfair, it's to Russia's disadvantage, that Russia is a great power and needs to be treated like a great power and must have certain rights in its neighbourhood, uh, which is not getting at the moment. Now, we can debate whether Russia is right or wrong um, to think that, but I think it's indubitable that it does. It's very clear from the way that um, Mr Putin and other Russian leaders speak is they don't like the way the world is run. They don't like America as a European power. They don't like the way in which the European Union um, is exercising control over energy markets, they don't like NATO, there's a lot they don't like, and they have the chance to change it. Now, you may say this is crazy. The West has a combined GDP of over $40 trillion. Russia's GDP is around $2 trillion. So how on earth can we be worried about a security threat from Russia? Well, the answer is that Russia has the ability to exercise asymmetric pressure on the West. It can do things which the West is not able to respond to. We've had a lot of wake-up calls. We had the cyber attack on Estonia in 2007. We had the war in Georgia in 2008. We had the ZAPAD um, military exercises in 2009, which I think were the most deafening wake-up call. You could argue about the other ones, but when you saw two major military exercises happening side by side, with almost no Western military observers allowed to go there, and the scenario of that exercise was the invasion, occupation, and isolation of the Baltic states, and to drive the point home, it finished with a dummy nuclear attack on Warsaw. That was a wake-up call, and a lot of what we've been seeing since then in NATO has been the result of that, because that really caught NATO mapping. We had no idea what was going on. 
Um, and Russia has been systematically alarming, I would say even terrorizing or ter terrifying in some cases, um, the, the frontline states. We've also seen a dummy nuclear attack on um, Sweden, which happened on Good Friday 2013. We saw a dummy attack on Bornholm uh, last summer when the entire Danish political elite was gathered in, in Bornholm, the Danish island, for a uh, political festival. And this stuff has an effect. Now, maybe it's all part of an elaborate political game. Maybe Mr. Putin is doing this because he wants to show his public back home that Russia is a force to be taken reckon, to, 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 is a force to be reckoned with. But we can't sit here and say that's just Russia being Russia. This is real stuff. These are real troops, real weapons, real nuclear weapons being deployed in increasing numbers right on our border. And we'd be crazy if we don't respond to that. We've got a particular problem in the Baltic states because the Baltic states are rather like West Berlin. They are indefensible in narrow military terms. We can only defend the Baltic states by having the whole deterrent credibility of the West behind them. That worked with West Berlin during the Cold War. I think it will work with the Baltic states. But we have to be serious. Our credibility is absolutely at stake. And if Russia subverts or attacks the Baltic states, maybe by non-military means, and doesn't rec receive the right response in the West, NATO could be over by breakfast. NATO's credibility is hanging, perhaps by a thread, in the Baltic states um, if we don't get our act together on deterrence there. But it's not just the military stuff. Um, when we look at what happened in Ukraine, we saw the whole panoply, the whole range of this very sophisticated hybrid war that Russia is able to wage. Information propaganda, something that the West used to do very well, helped us win the Cold War, helped us beat the Nazis. We went to sleep on that in 1991. Russia is putting hundreds of millions of dollars into things like RT and Sputnik with tremendous success. It's really working. Very belatedly, the West is trying to cope with that. Economic, trade, energy pressure, again, a major influence um, in Russia's victory in Ukraine was the way they exploited their commensurately much heavier economic weight against Ukraine. But they're doing it in other countries too. We've seen these targeted sanctions against the Baltic states and against other countries, the use of energy as a weapon. We have to be on our guard about that. The use of, of corruption, not just organized crime, but buying political parties, buying politicians, buying think tanks, buying academia worked very well um, in Ukraine, it's working in the front -like states, but it's working in Western Europe as well. Where does Marine Le Pen get her money from? From the Front National, which is one of these corrosive anti-systemic forces which is trying to bust the European Union, and I would argue would also um, bust NATO. These right -wing, far right, far left, and other anti-systemic parties are feeding in the Kremlin trough, sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly. The use of espionage. Russia never gave up espionage against the West. The West largely gave up espionage against Russia. And we're now just coming to terms with how deep the penetration is, um, not just of the frontline states, but of, of Western Europe and of North America. Every now and again, we catch Russian spies. These days, we don't shut up about it. We actually make a fuss. We even prosecute them and deport, and deport them. But we are playing catch up on that. We're way behind. And then, of course, the military point, which I mentioned before. People don't realize this because they think, oh, the West has the military advantage. We don't. Russia has escalation dominance in the Baltic states. They can do stuff which we can't do. Putin knows it, and he knows that we know it. And we are scrambling to catch up on this. Maybe when we get the JASM stealth missile in Poland, maybe if we get some F-22s, maybe if we, um, if, if we recover our ability um, to have a nuclear doctrine, then maybe we can catch up. At the moment, Russia is on the front foot, and we are very much on the back. This is not new. We were warned about this. We were warned about this for years, and we were warned about it by you guys. If I say you guys, I mean the former captive nations. Lennart Meri, the Estonian president, in Hamburg in 1994, gave a speech of immense prescience where he warned about what was happening. He was looking then at the foot dragging and the of, of the Russian military withdrawal from the Baltic states and the all then, already then clear use of propaganda and subversion and other means what we now call hybrid warfare against the, Baltic, against the Baltics. And he said, this is not going to end well. Maybe we'll be lucky, but it's not looking good from what we see in the Baltics. He warned about imperialism. He warned about the growth, even then under Yeltsin, of this kind of secret police, Czechist culture. And the people from the frontline states were not listened to. They were mocked, belittled, patronized. And now, 11 years later, that right? No, 21 years later. Sorry, my arithmetic was never my strong point. I work for economists sometimes. Um, we are now realizing the frontline states are right. You guys warned us. Václav Havel warned us. 
us. Let them in some warnings. All sorts of people warned us. We didn't listen. Now it's almost too late. Thank you for the warning. We're now, I hope, taking it seriously. Edward Lucas, thank you very much indeed. Right. Um, now, that's the pro first proposer for the motion. Now the first opponent uh, of the motion. And I'll remind those who might have just arrived, it's NATO and EU member states in Western Europe must assume Russia will work to subvert them, including using military force. Ivan, you have eight minutes. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, I was impressed by what Edward said. And actually, I do participate in, uh, in many conferences and debates like this. And I must say that this is a standard way of argumentation which I had heard for tens, uh, probably hundreds, hundreds times. So, and believe me, there are lots of people in Russia who would, uh, who would promote the same argumentation about NATO and the West. So if you hear the opponents of NATO of, uh, in Russia, and there are lots of them, uh, they would say probably the same, the text would be the same, but instead Russia will be NATO, the West, etc. So what strikes me is that there is rhetoric uh, in Russia and in the West is nearly the same. Uh, and actually we blame each other, we try to convince each other who is guilty, who started first, who started second, uh, who is more evil, who is more devoted, who, who is more devil, etc., etc. But few people propose what should we do. So we hear a lot about Russia and is, uh, as an evil here in the West and as a, about the West and NATO as an evil in Russia. But what is the constructive agenda? How should we go out the wise circle? If we continue blaming, blaming each other, we will solve no problem, starting from Ukraine and ending with more fundamental ones. What alarms me uh, is that the Ukrainian tragedy, Ukrainian problem uh, starts to affect more fundamental issues of our relations with the West. It starts to affect uh, fundamentals of the Euro-Atlantic architecture. Look what do we have, for instance, with INF and uh, START treaties. The key, the fundamental treaties regarding nuclear proliferation and the limitation of, uh, of nuclear weapons. So what we witness now is the erosion of this, uh, of this treaties. If we don't have these treaties, our security will be much less, European security, I mean. Will it be better for Ukraine? I think no. So uh, my proposal and my thought, though I'm, I also, let's say, uh, I, I can understand this game of blaming each other, but I propose to think about common interests, even in this hard time. Uh, yes, the wishful, th wishful thinking is over, but the current crisis is, a, is an important stimulus for us to stop further spiral of fear and further spiral of, of, of hostility, mutual hostility, because uh, at the end, the end will not be, let's say, positive. There is a real and growing threat of further escalation. Well, my proposal is to think about joint interests, to think about uh, joint problems. What is the Russian interest? What is the Russian strategic interest? If you ask this question to the well, for Western media the, or, let's say, average Western observers, the, the answer will be that the Russian interest is an aggression, military, uh, intervention, etc., etc. Well, I cannot agree with this as a Russian. I think that the strategic Russian interest is the development, is an economic diversification, is the increase of living standards of, of the Russian people. And we will not be able to do it without Europe and without the West. The West is an important source of technologies, of investment, of human capital for us. So the current uh, hostility strategically contradicts the Russian interest. Uh, second point is that, well, we have a number of, of common interests and common problems which we need to deal together. And sooner or later, the understanding of this will be much higher than today. Uh, ISIS, start with this. 
Uh, ISIS is becoming more and more influential in, cent in Central Asia, Asia, for instance. And the, the threat that the Central Asia will explode is uh, getting higher and higher. So this is one of the challenges we, we should deal together. Uh, the problem of nuclear proliferation, the, the, problem, uh, uh, the, the problem of local conflicts. So there are lots of them. And the hostility we have now actually diminishes our global competitiveness, the competitiveness of Russia and the competitiveness of Europe as well. So what we need is, is to change the paradigm of our relations uh, from the zero-sum game to, to common responsibility. Uh, let's take the problem of Ukraine. Uh, we, our discourse is dominated by, let's say, mutual accusation and hostility. But the problem will not be possible to be solved without our joint action. So unilateral solution is impossible. Ukrainian problem may be solved only together by Russia and the West. And sooner or later, we will come to this. The earlier we will go to, to, to this understanding, the better it is. Uh, so <clears throat> so uh, my thought and my argument is that we need to change the paradigm of our relations as soon as possible. Otherwise, uh, this, uh, the question which, we, which, we, which we, we, we have here in the future will be 100 uh, true. By now, it is, uh, it is still false. Thanks. Ivan, thank you very much indeed. Ivan Timofeev. Uh, so now you've heard the first two speakers for the motion and against the motion. Let's now get the seconders. Uh, George Friedman, you have six minutes. I think that Russia is a threat, not because it is strong and powerful and capable, but because it's not. And because it's breeds of insecurity in Russia that it must respond to. And if I were Russian, not American, I would likely behave the same way. We have to remember that their behavior in the Ukraine was incompetent, beyond belief. Their intelligence service failed to anticipate what was happening in Kiev. It failed to manage the situation satisfactorily. It allowed a pro-Russian president to be displaced through a very strange process. Uh, this does not speak to the tremendous capability. I know in this region, I'm Hungarian, the KGB is 15 feet tall and we're all idiots. But they removed many of the leadership of the intelligence service. They tried an uprising in eastern Russia. It didn't happen. They grabbed a small part of Russia, of uh, eastern Ukraine, and Crimea, where six months before, they had been the dominant influencer of events in Ukraine. They now, at the end, held a small part. This is a continuation of a retreat by Russia that began in 1989, with the great borderland, the first belt, the Baltic, Belarus, Ukraine, and the second borderland from Poland to Bulgaria that they seized in the Second World War, both dissolved. From the Russian point of view, this is an unacceptable position. A NATO was once 1,000, 1,100 miles from St. Petersburg. It is now 100 miles from St. Petersburg. So if I'm a Russian, then something must be done. And if I'm Vladimir Putin and I head the state, I say this is a geopolitical catastrophe and I must address it. This is where the danger comes from. Not that the Russians have brilliant Machiavellian plans. If they had such, they would control Ukraine today. Uh, it is precisely because they are backed into a corner by history. Part of the corner is geopolitical, the loss of their borderland. Part of it is economic, their vulnerability to the price of energy. And regime survival is a fundamental question to them. They certainly have the capability of improving their forces. And they look out and they see the Americans deploying in Poland, deploying in Romania, small deployments yet. But the Russians also know something else. 
1932, Germany was a liberal and catastrophically weak power. By 1938, it had transformed itself into the major power. Therefore, the current correlation of forces, as the Russians would call it, is not relevant. They are therefore preparing the counter to their failures. And these counters will be multimodal, from subversion to the training and improvement and deployment of military forces so they could perform better. They will bring pressure all along the frontier. But one of the mistakes we made in the Cold War was constantly overestimating the Soviet capability. And <clears throat> we constantly failed to match where it needed to be matched by overestimating some things and underestimating others. It is very important to look at this situation through Russian eyes. Not because we're pro-Russian, and not because we don't see a Russian threat, but the Russian threat cannot be understood without understanding the Russian weakness that they're responding to. All through the Cold War, I asked the question, why don't the Russians invade Western Europe? Which we were told was well within their reach. Afterwards, or even during it, it became clear they couldn't. It is the couldn't that makes Russia enormously dangerous. It is the insecurity, the sense of failure that will cause them to take risks they might not otherwise take. The lesson of the Ukraine is that this must not happen again. And if this must not happen again, then indeed the Baltics are a place they might stop. This is not because the Russians will succeed. It is not, in my mind, because the West has failed to prepare. It is because the West has been so successful against Russia. The period of Gorbachev was so catastrophic for Russia. American promises not to advance, Western promises not to advance NATO into the former Soviet Union, on and on and on, have pushed the Russians back into a position. Putin attempted to demonstrate that Russia was a great power. And then in the Ukraine, that question was raised, just how great it was. Never fear great powers. They're not insecure, and they need to not go to war. The powers you need to fear are those that wish to be great powers and don't know how to do it. So yes, I fully agree with Edward that Russia is a threat, that Russia will try to subvert NATO. But I fear it not because it's so effective. I fear it because it needs to become effective. George Friedman, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> now the uh, final voice from the platform uh, against the motion. Yevgeny, you have six minutes. And then I will be opening up to all of you uh, in the auditorium. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, first of all, yes. Definitely, Russia does not intend to subvent the uh, European Union or any other European states. Uh, can I just check? Can you all hear? Is that I, right? I suppose you yes. I yeah. hear echo, my... which no, it's fine, it's says yeah. there is a microphone. <laughs> Operational. <laughs> uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, uh, there is not uh, that much what Russia can get from uh, new territory, new people, uh, because uh, that does not mean that we don't need, but we are inefficiently use what we have. Um, in effect, the Russian economy is not extremely efficient in using its own resources and uh, its own people and its own territory. So, in fact, uh, so the plate doesn't worth uh, so the cost uh, which uh, which may uh, which 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 it may involve. Uh, so that's the first point, and uh, in my opinion, it's very important. Uh, uh, first or uh, second of all. Uh, there is no ideology. So every time when uh, one institution, one country, one state would like one subvents uh, other state states, um, there should be a proper ideology underlying it. For example, uh, with the USSR, and it was an appropriate case, there was a, a, a permanent revolution idea and the proletariat hegemony, which is not the case right now. Russia, in fact, is a capitalist state with all the ideologies planted relatively deep there with a lot less social protection, for example, of population, uh, labor, um, 
labor force and others than, for example, many, many other European states. We are more like the United States right now than, for example, any other European states. Uh, it's wild, I would say. So that means no proper ideology for domination at all uh, in terms of, in terms of uh, say, political, in terms of political strong influence. And that's, that's a very important. And business, business dominates many questions, especially when internal affairs are being done. So, and, uh, the, sec and uh, the last point, which is, in my uh, opinion, very important, uh, and Ivan has already touched that. In fact, as a person who can read, uh, read, speak, uh, write Russian, English, French, uh, and understanding a few more languages, I can tell you that uh, um, every part of the conflict, they prepare themselves for defense. It's extremely difficult to subvent someone when you pretend, uh, when, you, when you intend to defend. Both societies, they pretend to defend themselves from each other. So Russia from NATO, which Ivan has already mentioned, and uh, NATO, NATO members and EU members from Russia. Uh, I, as, a, as an economist, I can easily imagine the case when one, uh, one say, one power subvents the other. Uh, and uh, it's very straightforward, like in the Cold War, it's exhaustion. So one side should get exhausted in the, as a result of the conflict. Uh, in terms of economy, it was already mentioned by Edward. Um, you, have, you have, with the correction to the exchange rate, 30 to 40 uh, trillion dollar op op opinions against uh, something, not even 2 trillion dollar. We have 1.6 trillion dollar after the de devaluation of national currency. So two heavy weights against an uh, extremely lightweight uh, player. Nothing, nothing, no, nothing to speak about. I, don't even doubt that, that no one has illusions that uh, a lightweight player can easily overplay two heavyweight players in this case because economy is the basis for any any in increase in defense spendings. Everything is about money in the end of the story. And yes, Russia can do something which Western powers can't, definitely. But uh, this is not like getting, uh, say, a few trillion dollars out of nowhere, uh, spending it on defense, uh, and uh, then threatening everyone around the world. So I mean, th that's simply not possible because the economy, e economics, economics bases um, approximately the same laws as physics in this case. Money cannot be taken out of nowhere. And even if you think, think that central banks print them, no, uh, ju just of, uh, out of air. This is not. This is not. This is not true. It's totally different. So every every time when new money appears in the economy, there is price for that. And price for that, for example, uh, maybe uh, for printing new money, maybe inflation. So that's exactly what Russians are paying now. And I say you that there is not so much willingness to pay even more in terms of high inflation for the uh, higher government spendings. And uh, so what, what is even more important in this case and what I would like to address, uh, to address here, uh, what we are losing, this is not related straightforward to the topic, but I would like to address that very, uh, because that's very important for all European region, I would say not Eurasian, but European. What's happening? We are bleeding capital. We are bleeding uh, financial and physical capital, both you and we are. We are uh, bleeding human capital, and uh, at this moment, Asian regions develop extremely rapidly. So we are losing prospects, and they get these prospects uh, uh, instead of us. And that's exactly the result of what we are having right now, and that's what I extremely dislike as economists. That's why I see that there is no single uh, reason why we should be in such a confrontation. Uh, we politically may dislike each other, but economically right now, the price we both pay for that is extremely high and I don't even doubt that because I read again, write and speak, uh, thank you, uh, to many people that uh, most of the actors from both, or from both sides of the conflict understand that perfectly. That means they have uh, never uh, have in mind, they have not have in their minds an idea of subventing uh, the other power because the result is well understood for both sides actually. Uh, Asia will be the new, the new superpower, and uh, Europe and Russia will not be big players. Uh, this will be a lose-lose game for both of us. And that's exactly, that's exactly what both sides don't like at all. And that's why I don't really think that uh, a big, say, uh, confrontation will rise from what's currently happening. And, by the way, I would just like to address your attention to a few facts mentioned, in, uh, mentioned by my colleagues. Uh, espionage of Russia. And what's about Merkel uh, conflict and U.S. Uh, spies listening to her lines? Uh, are they going to subvent European Union? I'm going to have to stop thank you, you. Evgeny, because uh, I've got to be fair to both sides. Evgeny, thank you.
Right, we have uh, about 50 minutes to go. Uh, that'll include the vote at the end and also 10 minutes for the wind up and then uh, uh, ending the whole session. So we have about uh, 40 minutes for views from the floor. What would be great, if possible, uh, is if you can say, I'm for the motion or I'm against the motion. Because in true British style, I'd like to have balance in this debate. So the floor is open. I do not want long speeches. You can ask questions if you want, but it's also good to hear your view. And there's a gentleman down here um, and a gentleman there. So let's get the microphones moving very quickly. Back. And uh, I'd like you to think in terms of about a minute, please. Okay. Are you for or against the motion? I'm for the motion. And my uh, two brief points. One is in relation to the threat uh, posed by the Russian Federation. Yes, it may be a very small economy, but so was Japan. Japan was one-tenth of the British Empire of the U.S., in 1941, it took four years and two nuclear weapons to reduce them. And my second point as to the actual reason, the core of all of this, is the operating principle of the Russian elite is corruption. Karen Dashworth in a book on, on, on Putin, Putin's kleptocracy says that the Russian state budget is $300 billion a year and the Russian elite steal $300 billion a year. They have got nowhere else to go and if they can't keep them themselves in power, uh, through, if you like, constitutional means, they're prepared to use any other means possible, including war. So you have, these are not the nice Soviets at the end of the Soviet period who will walk off into history. These people will fight and die to hold on to what they have because they have no other alternative. All right, and I, I would invite any comments from any of the four speakers. Right, who else would like to speak? Particularly someone who's against the motion. Uh, who's against the motion? You, you've got the microphone. You're against, are you? It will work. That microphone, please. That's it, yeah. No, Let's it's working. Yeah, go so ahead. one remark, I'm working in Turkey. Are you for or against? Uh, against. Uh, one remark, I'm an owner of a travel agency, and last year we had a decrease of Russian tourists and Ukrainian tourists by more than 30% in turn of a 50%. So not only, the, not only the big businesses are suffering, but also small businesses. And we need to stop it. Uh, and um, uh, my question is uh, to Ivan. You said it might not end in a positive way, this situation. It sounds a little bit dangerous. So what do you have in mind? Thank you. All right, thank you. Do you want to answer that, Ivan? A specific question to you mm -hmm. now. OK. Answer it now, yeah. Well, uh, I don't think it, uh, uh, the dangerous situation we will have when we don't have a positive goal. The dangerous situation is when we continue blaming each other, uh, satisfying our ego. We will, th this is a way to nowhere. We must have a positive agenda. This might seem a wishful thinking, but any progress starts with wishful thinking. Any progress starts with positive idea. Without this idea, we will have a blind alley. Ed Lucas. I think... We need to stick to the motion here. Um, of course we should look for areas of common interest. Our quarrel is not with the Russian people or with Russian businesses or with Russian tourists. Our quarrel is with the Russian regime, and that's fine. We can also discuss, if you want, who's to blame for that, for, 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 for this conflict we're in, but that's also not what the motion says. The motion says, should we um, assume um, that Russia will work to subvert us? And the evidence strongly points in that direction. And it seems to me if you're really, the, the really worst outcome is if we continue to assume the opposite of this motion. NATO and EU member states in Western Europe should assume Russia will not work to subvert them, particularly not including military force. Do you really think that would be a good basis to plan on? Right, thank you. Right, let's get more views from the floor. Who would like to speak for the motion? Right, there's a lady there and a lady there. Who would like to speak against the motion? I know there are quite a lot of you in there because I've got the numbers here. Please. Please. Okay, we'll come to you in a moment. Uh, the lady there first. Hello, my name is Katarina Maternova. I would like Just to... Just speak again, again, please. Um, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Yes. Uh, my name is Katarina Maternova. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the presentations. I would like to speak for the motion. And I have a very simple question to our uh, two Russian participants. Uh, who spoke about both sides of the conflict and painted sort of a picture of uh, the West and Russia being involved in a, in, a, in a kind of a conflict. And I would like you to elaborate on that because I'm not sure what, what, 
both sides of the conflict mean, if you could All right. just clarify. Thank you. You'll come to, we'll come to that in a moment. And I want to know, is anyone up there wanting to, to speak as well? I can't see anything because of the lights, but shout. Yes. Good, okay. You've got microphones there. We'll come to you in a moment. Who would like to speak against the motion, please? Yes, the gentleman here, please. Uh, microphone down here, please, fast. And I'll come to you in a moment, okay? Because I want to keep balance for the moment, please, this gentleman here. I am uh, Mahash al Hamli from uh, United Arab Emirates. Actually, I'm now between, but I go with against because uh, the lesson learned from 1990, Iraq invading Kuwait, until Ukraine passing through 11 September, and uh, war uh, against ISIS show that uh, Russian not only economy issues, it is also political issues, which is they are strongly, they are member of Security Council. They are having better relation with Asians than Europeans. And if we speak about uh, 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 NATO, NATO is the going to carry the war or the, the aggressive, which is member of EU, uh, EU, uh, EU. And the EU, they are not ready to go against Russian war. Right, thank you. Right, I'll get two more views, uh, a lady there for the motion first. Uh, so yeah, for the motion, my uh, question is definitely for the uh, Russian representatives. So if we are about the positive game and about the positive results, something constructive, so uh, why and what you could do for doing what is in Russian power, seizing the border with Ukraine, stopping giving the Russian terrain for the separatist forces, stopping the, uh, the bringing the weapon to the Ukrainian territory and uh, keeping close to the international law, like with the case of Crimea and also having a fair debate about the gas price and all the things which is just there and are constructive and are in Russian power and the, uh, the Moscow can influence. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a gentleman up there, are you for or against, please? I'm for the motion. All Andreas right. Umland is right. my name. Just one moment. Is there anyone up there who wants to speak against the motion, please? I can't see any hands, so please great, shout. Yeah. Right, there's, a, uh, <laughs> there's someone in the lights. But let me go to that one first. Please, you're against. Thank you. Thank you. Ed. <clears throat> My name is Milan Milutinovic. I come from the Strategic Research Institute in Serbia and Belgrade. Uh, in 2013, I would be against motion because in 2013, I was attending NATO school in Obergau and one of the lecturers was eminent uh, defense economist from NATO headquarters. He told us that uh, United States of America used to give uh, between 5 and 4.7 percent of GDP for defense and that starting from fiscal 2015, that amount was supposed to be reduced to three, uh, maybe 3%. And later I, I collected the data, cal calculated that the difference would be about $250 billion per year. So for me, the question was, is the defense, uh, military defense complex to, uh, going to let lose that money just like that? Or maybe we are going to get some new crisis somewhere else right, in the well world. I'll ask George and, uh, and Ed to answer that particular point. First the, of all, there the, were two. The other oh, one, one moment. So please. just the question is, uh, Aren't we faced with the situation that uh, somebody needs a reason to rob his taxpayers for next several years, threatening them with the uh, awakened Russian bear, which he woke, woke up intentionally? All That's right, the it's question. being driven by tax considerations. The, the George, hang on a moment, because there are other questions over there. Mm -hmm. uh, right, uh, for both of you, there were two questions which were tabled. Ivan. Okay, so uh, I will start with the last one. Uh, it seems to me most important. What should we uh, do to start uh, this uh, to reverse the trend, I think uh, we should uh, we should start to promote Minsk agreements. Uh, what we have now uh, in the in the discourse uh, is uh, well, let's say blaming that uh, Russia should press uh, and must press uh, separatists and rebels to do this, this, and this. But this should be let's say parallel movements. Yes, Russia should and must uh, press uh, uh, rebels at, to, to, to the extent that uh, she can do. Uh, to uh, maintain the agreements. But the West, you and the United States should also, should also influence the Ukrainian government to uh, follow this, uh, uh, these agreements. So this should be a simultaneous process. And if we have a progress here, this will be a very uh, a good step forward. Uh, the very fact that we have this agreement is, is already quite a positive sign. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, I like your question about uh, about political issues. Uh, I think you're right, and uh, we forget we often forget that Russia is not only a threat but also an opportunity. And it strikes me that I, I deal a lot with foreign diplomats outside the Western world, and uh, uh, their discourse is completely different. It is in terms of opportunities. Uh, let remember Syrian pr problem of chemical weapon. It was the Russian initiative to, to solve it. Imagine what would we have if chemical weapon uh, would be in the hands of, uh, let's say, the forces you, you understand. Uh, and uh, another question, who are the parts of the conflicts? Well, that, that's an obvious, uh, an obvious question, if I understand you right. Well, the parts of the conflict, and it's, 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 uh, well, it's a tragedy for me personally, the collective West and Russia. Collect what, what do I mean by, by collective West? In terms of institution, uh, institutions, I mean NATO, I mean the United States, I mean the European Union. Right. Ed and George, I'll have a point to, uh, chance to come back. Do you want to pick up on any of those three specific questions aimed at uh, your side, the Russian side, against the motion, Evgeny? Uh, uh, I would like to address uh, your attention to the fact that when we speak about violating international laws and, uh, and stuff, um, it's extremely difficult to determine what is law for a state. There is law for people. There is law for but companies. If are, but if there are treaties and there are laws which are that's, passed in That's Parliament, a great problem. There is, like no, the there is no proper mechanism to enforce laws. So sometimes states do, uh, uh, in, uh, it may be one state or maybe uh, se several states which collect and decide to do something which may not be legal. You're suggesting uh, from the law is discretionary. Yes, for the states, unfortunately, yes. And that's the problem. For example, with Yugoslavia, that's a very known case. Uh, have you got a good solution for that? I mean, did Russia, did Russia try to subvent anyone objecting that solution? Or with Iraq, or maybe with Ye Yemen, which is upcoming. So, I mean, states uh, try to decide certain questions. They may have good ideas in the heads of leaders, but unfortunately, they sometimes act with no respect to the law right. simply because there is no proper enforcement mechanism. And that's a bad story. But it doesn't mean that any state would like to subvent or destroy some, some other state. Edward and George, do you want to come George, back on that point? Us. And then George will ask, answer that point as well. Sir, uh, we're spending a great deal of time of what we would like and what would be proper and everything else. Rarely does history give us room for that particular option. Um, who was responsible for the First World War is a fascinating question if you are not busy doing something useful. That it happened must be understood. Very rarely do wars happen because people wake up in the morning and say, I want to kill somebody. Well, they may, but that's not why wars happen. Wars happen because of objective fears, serious per imperatives, and so on. Uh, the situation of Russia is such that if Belarus became pro-Western, the city of Smolensk would be a border town. This is not a sustainable situation and has not been one that existed in Russia since the 18th century. The idea that the Russian Federation can exist without a buffer zone is unrealistic. Now, Economically, they may not be able to afford it, but in fact, it was proven that economically, the Russians never could afford World War II. The ability of the Russians to do what has to be done must be acknowledged and respected. So, I don't, I'm not an economist, I don't know, but I will certainly make the case that that's possible. As to the point about the U.S. defense expenditure, the United States runs two defense budgets. One is at 3%. Then there's one for the war fighting budget, which is at two, $250 billion, which brings it to 5%. The American budget did not decline because, wisely or unwisely, and I would vote against it if it was Oxford rules, uh, we're, operate, we're operating two multi-divisional wars, plus smaller wars at the same time, and that costs money. The idea that this is a military-industrial complex wanting to create war, I think, is as simplistic is to think that Putin gets up in the morning, you know, one of these four children in the Ukraine. I mean, these are smart, not necessarily pleasant men and women, but they are doing what they have to do in the position. Right, they're George, uh, 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 those, those points from Ivan yeah. and Yevgeny. I sort of push back briefly on the idea that 
um, there's no, the international law is, is really discretionary. Because I think there's, there's chunks of the world where that is true. There's chunks of the world where there is no real rule of law. We saw that very clearly with the South African um, decision not to keep the Sudanese president um, in that country, even though there was an international arrest warrant out there. But much criticised for it. Much criticised, but we do have a European security order, which is based on two pretty clear principles. It's the idea of rules, and it's the idea of free choice, free choice of your domestic political arrangements, free choice of your external um, diplomatic arrangements. And that goes back a long way. That goes back to the Helsinki Final Act of 1975. It was entrenched in the Paris Charter of 1990. It also had many other things, including the Budapest Memorandum, which was, uh, which was briefly mentioned. It's not perfect at all. The West is not... Um, it would be ludicrous to argue that we get everything right. Um, but I think it's worth preserving. I think it's a really important civilizational achievement that we've taken Europe, which is the scene of some of the greatest genocides in world history, and we've created an institutional arrangement which is designed to stop people killing each other. And you believe that's under threat now? And that is under huge threat because Putin doesn't like it. He says Russia is a very big country, and in a world where might equals right, and where you don't have these alliances and rules and institutions, Russia will count for a lot more. In a bilateral negotiation with any individual European country, Russia is an equal or superior. Faced with a united Europe, Russia is um, very much the inferior. So therefore, it makes complete sense from Putin's point of view to try and break European unity wherever he can, because that puts Russia back in the front seat again. Right. I don't want to live in a world and a Europe where might equals right, the big countries that do, that do the deals they can, and the small countries do the deals that they must. Right, thank you. How many people, we have about 20 minutes to run, would like to intervene? I can see about 12 hands, so do the mathematics. Right, I'm going to go up there first, because I... Uh, I intervened and yes. stopped you a moment ago. Please, are you for or against? Uh, I'm in, against in principle, emotion. I'm for, but uh, I'm, I, have a, I have a point to make, sort of. Uh, what do you mean in principle for? Uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm hearing different things. There, there seems to be, uh, I live in, in Kiev, and, and the argument of Mr. Friedman seemed seem to be, and uh, it also was on the other side of the, of the debate, that Russia is doing what it is doing because it's weak. Uh, in Ukraine, the perception, and I guess the same perception there is in Moldova and in Georgia, is simply Russia is doing because it is so much more powerful and because these countries are not members of the European Union and of NATO, and it would be doing the same things to uh, Latvia and to Estonia, where there are also large Russian minorities that arguably have even less, um, or they have actually uh, l less rights than, uh, than Russian minorities in Ukraine, for instance. And it is doing these things not because it is uh, weak, but because it is relatively strong and because uh, Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia don't get the, the support uh, so that, you, you, that you, the Baltics be, get. Just to be clear, you said in principle for the motion, but. What's the big but? Well, because the, I think there's a distraction here. I think the, the, my, in my view, what is happening now to the Baltic countries and, and the, in the whole confrontation between the West and Russia is a distraction from what, is, what Ru Russia is actually interested right, in okay. in Ukraine. Right. Who would like to speak against the motion? Please. Microphone to someone. I'll come to you. Are you for or against? Right, you're against. Yes, yes. Fine. The gentleman at the back who's against. Okay. Please. Okay, I am against. I will not. I have no specific uh, reason, uh, but uh, well, I, I think that uh, in the end you must have some reason. Yes, yes, of course. You must have some of argument. Course, of Help course. us understand. I think that in the end the cooler heads. Uh, also in Russia, or cooler head will prevail. But I also I want to stress that I understand the Western view uh, that uh, Russia now, and especially the leadership, is unpredictable. It's much more unpredictable, for example, than was Gorbachev, and also I think, for example, Andropov. So Russia is not the partner that it was in the 80s. Thank you very much indeed. Right, uh, who's for the motion? Please, the gentleman there has the microphone, I hope. Do you have the microphone? Uh, and I'm going to hear Thank several you. several views now, so take notes, please. Okay, uh, I'm Martin Ugrosi from Hungary. Say again, I'm, please. I am Martin Ugrosi from Hungary, and I'm, I am for the motion. And that is because Russia, for sure, cannot match the West in matters of economy and military might, and they would be foolish not to subvert the European Union if they could. And they're using their competitive advantage. They're using espionage. They're using blackmail. 
Uh, they're using blackmail through energy. They are corrupting leading politicians from the from the region because they are good at it. And why wouldn't they use it if they can? And as long as they will not find partners in the Eastern European capitals and maybe in the Western European capitals as well, they will continue to do so. So that's All something right. the EU has to stand up to. All right. Uh, who's against now, please? The, the gentleman down here. But I, first of all, Ivan, I'm going to come to you because I heard a very long sigh when you heard that. They're good at subversion, picking up what Ed said earlier. What's your response to that? You're good at subversion. I'm quite um, skeptical about the argumentation about blackmailing. But the about evidence is there. Where? But Ed, <laughs> Ed produced so it. So Ed, Ed was subverted or blackmailed <laughs> by, <laughs> Russian, <laughs> by, by, by Russian special forces. Come Am on, guys. Am I allowed guys. to call you Ed the subverter? Please, uh, uh, please read less do yellow press. Ed, do you feel subverted? Yeah. I've written three books on this, which I'd heartily recommend to you and everybody in the audience. <laughs> Okay. But Good. it's your chance, as he's got three books and you've got two minutes. It's your chance, no it's your chance to give the alternative argument against, we'll call him Ed the Subverter, right? Well, well yeah, of course, uh, there, is, uh, there is always a game of uh, spies and special forces. But from, this is from, a from, serious from, issue, yes, it's not of, a game. Of course, not of course, game. but, but this, is, uh, this is not a new phenomenon. Special forces have been always competing with each other. So this is not a new thing. So, uh, and to, to, to think that Russian special forces are bad, and for instance, Westerns or Chinese, Chinese or Arabic or something like, like this are good. So this is a, no, we're talking about this the technique very of naive. subversion, not what's good or bad. The technique well, of subversion. But but this uh, technical competition is is an old thing. It didn't start yesterday or today. It's 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 peculiar to to the whole. It's a logic of uh, coexistence of special forces. To switch sides for the moment. I mean. Uh, we're unpacking what the United States did. So, and the United During States is the leader in terms of uh, No, cyber. You're, pretty, you're pretty good. Don't, uh, <laughs> it, don't go that far. But, I mean, we're all shocked, shocked to find that there is intelligence operations going on and the Russians are carrying them out. What's interesting to me about that, not really like a comment, is how badly the Russian special services operated in Ukraine. I mean, that would be an interesting you know, discussion. Because right, this is well, not a question of economy. Is it, they have the money. They don't need $3 trillion. trillion. What is the structural problem there? Yevgeny, you come back. Do you think there's bad subversion by Russian forces, both uniformed and non-uniformed, in eastern Ukraine? Respond I, to what George said. That comes back as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, but what I said is you didn't operate very effectively. I didn't say you were good or okay, bad. I, um, it's, di it's, difficult, it's difficult to say for sure, uh, for me at least. I'm not a specialist to say you uniformed, uniformed special forces. It's, uh, even if, even if it, had, it took place, it's not like a uh, commonplace uh, to know. I do, I do believe that there were certain activities which uh, uh, were generated, as I think at least, as I think, but um, by a good will, but resulted in a bad will, as I told you, because there is no a proper law proper road for the government to solve an issue if, for example, it feels itself misunderstood. Well, let me just put, uh, some, many, some of you so, were not there, but Alexander Verschbau, the Deputy Secretary General of NATO, two hours ago at the Kempinski said there's clear evidence of, uh, of, of, has he, has he shown of regular, of regular just, Russian yeah, forces. Yeah, yeah, just one subversive. question. Has he shown something? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't object, I don't object. But, but of ju course the Russians have spent special forces I've heard there. I've now both so sides have, from both so sides. Have, no, I no. disbelieve, by the way, I disbelieve both sides. Those Russians who say that American spies are in Ukrainian special forces and stuff, and I disbelieve those from the NATO side which say that Russian regular forces are in Ukraine. Because I haven't seen uh, facts. Well, Show me the facts, please, and I will agree. And I, let me give That's you a That's very simple. As Unless simple as the Russians like. are idiots, which they're not, they have special forces there. Unless the Americans are idiots, they have special forces there. So the answer is that, of course, both and, sides and have it. And subverting them, who? But, but I mean, just, just <laughs> one question. Well, it's not a question of subversion. In the case of the Eastern Ukraine, <laughs> if you're providing... If not, do you ask me about that? <laughs> why do, I didn't ask I you mean, about... I, so, well, there's wait, two issues. You asked about ways. What is the political... Well, you had said that because you didn't have the finances to build up the Soviet military, 
I came back and said, yes, but you do have the finances to build up an intelligence service. The issue of this is not a charge. It's yes, simply not maybe. an right. observation. The, the issue of and to defend Russian-speaking population, why not? It's not bad. It's not I'm not complaining. I'm just, let's not pretend. I'm complaining. Um, right, let me make it clear. The issue of subversion was put on the agenda by one of the speakers from the floor and also earlier. So I'm looking, f looking for balance and clarification. Last, last remark on subversion for the moment from Edward. Okay. This isn't a game. It's not funny. Boris Nemtsov, who used to come to Globsex, dead. Anna Politkovska is dead. Um, Alexander Peripolichny, the whistleblower, is dead. Alexander Litvinenko is dead. Uh, we have Nadia Savchenko, who's been kidnapped and taken to jail in, Ru in, in Russia for a year. We have Eston Kova, the um, Estonian security official, kidnapped on Estonian territory, on NATO territory, in a special operation, taken to, um, taken to Russia and put on trial for illegal border crossings. Um, this is not a joke. This is stuff that is really happening. People are dying, lives are being ruined, the fate of nations is being determined. I would disagree slightly with George that I think Crimea was a textbook success. I think Crimea was an extremely well carried out operation, um, which I would take my hat off to the Russians who planned it. But the fundamental point about this, and this gets on to your point about subversion, is asymmetry. If you're sitting in the White House, Russia is not the top priority. If you're sitting in MI6, Russia is not the top priority. If you're sitting in any Western, West European country, we have put Russia down the priority list because we're worried about China, we're worried about the economy, which isn't growing. We're worried about terrorism. We're worried about Islamic State. We're worried about all this other stuff. And for 15, 20, 25 years, we've been saying, Russia, Soviet Union, job done, Europe whole and free. It's just those bolts and those crazy people barking in the background that actually we can do deals with Russia. It's all OK. Well, you know what? It's not OK. All right. Right. We've got 15 minutes, and I want to get many more voices. You wanted to speak, and the gentleman there wants to speak, and you want to speak. So I'm going to take uh, as many voices as possible, please. Uh, I'm against the uh, motion just because I feel that I think the, uh, the Russian threat's a little bit overhyped and a little bit ed editorialised. However, I think the... Uh, it's the, been editorialised. Yeah, a little bit too... It's a bit too simplistic to say, you know, oh, Russia's the, the biggest threat to Europe. It's going to subvert you know, every European state and so on. However, I just feel like the against side hasn't gone... Well, they, they've skipped around it about what were the motivations for Russia to do what it did in Ukraine. Um, I feel like the for side went into it a lot more than the against side. All right, I will come to you, ask you to respond to that. What were the motivations in Ukraine? Mm -hmm. But I want to hear more voices, please. Are you for or against? I'm for the motion. All right, let me hear you. Who's against, please? A gentleman down there, two of them. And the, you're against? Yeah, okay, fine, come to you. I think uh, Russia is still a threat. One moment, microphone, please. I think uh, Russia is still a threat because it still doesn't understand or doesn't want to understand its role in Eastern Europe, but also its historical role in Eastern Europe. A typical example of that would be, I, I think, last month, this Russian state TV published or broadcasted a documentary about the invasion of Czechoslovakia. And their interpretation of the invasion of Czechoslovakia was that they didn't invade but liberated Czechoslovakia because they eradicated the fascist tendencies in this country. For me, that's a very dangerous interpretation. And that's why I still consider Russia a threat. Thank you. Move the microphone down to this gentleman here, please. You're against. Uh, yes, uh, I'm against only because when I read this, uh, the, this motion itself, it says uh, NATO and EU member states must assume, you know, that they assume something. I thought that, you know, with, with serious intelligence work and serious policy making should be based on facts rather than assumptions. Well, those in intelligence and in government have to make working assumptions for planning purposes. Would you suggest another word? Well, I, I would rather say, you know, to do a bit, do, to, to base policies rather on, 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 on facts on the ground rather than on, than on than All right, on uh, could, you, could you mark down that issue to address in your final remarks, please? What assumption, what the nature of an assumption, please, all four of you, please. What about yeah. up here? Go ahead. Yeah, rather briefly. I just Are you for or against? Yeah, I'm, a for, I'm in for. I just don't understand why is it, it, it says in the future and not in the present tense. Sorry, no. we're, not, we're not hearing you very well. Yeah, I'm in for, for the motion. I just don't understand why we're still discussing this. I mean, it so, seems so obvious. And I welcome you just to watch one minute of Russia today in Spanish, for an example. Um, so, and I really appreciate Edward Lucas' comments that we're talking about serious issues here. I, I know there are some Ukrainians among the public 
who are showing remarkable talent in some of the things that are being discussed. Now, you were mentioning a question, Mr. Egmini. You were talking about the Russian-speaking population in Ukraine. Can you just name one Russian proposal in the OSC on the rights of minorities in Ukraine prior to March 2013? Thank you. And also, right. what do you think of the Nyenta report? Thank you. You have uh, two minutes each to address these remarks. There's a lady up there. I do apologize. Uh, are you for or against? Um, actually, I'm... Were I'm you responding when, the, when Ukraine came up? Yes, okay. sure. I'm yeah. against, and I actually Ukrainian, and I can explain even why. Um, basically, because Putin needs, um, I think, the economic collapse of Ukraine even more than the military victory. Um, just because in such a case, he will be able to leave all of the responsibility of the territories occupied to the Ukrainian government. And basically, the economic social tensions will undermine the whole Ukraine in such a case, and the military victory would give him uh, not such a control, but only on the part of the territory where uh, the economic, basically, tensions will help him to do this plan. That's why I'm actually against the motion in such a form it was presented to us. And basically just responding to... Are you saying that Western Europe is not vulnerable from Russia at the moment? Um, no, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying the comments uh, that basically we have to bear in mind also the economic tensions and have to talk more precisely eco economic, basically, outcomes. Right, thank you very much. Is there anyone else up there? Yes. Uh, uh, I can't see you though. Where are you? Just one person for the motion. Uh, oh, you got the microphone. Okay, yes. far away. Yes, please. Um, it's interesting if our Russian. Are you for or I'm, against? I'm for the motion. Uh, it's because our Russian colleagues are hopeful about this new era of cooperation with ISIS and uh, nuclear non-proliferation, but yet they, look, they use the oldest Cold War tactic in the book, which is whataboutism. The first speaker says, oh yeah, well, what about NATO? And what about the US? The second speaker says about intelligence, well, what about the, what the US is doing in Europe? Uh, we don't hear anything from the Russian side about what they're actually doing not to intervene. What are they actually doing to commit positive steps in Europe? It's true, one speaker did say that they're not intervening in Yemen. You get a gold star for that. But have you actually made any other arguments as to what exactly you're doing to make a positive step towards the security future in Western Thank Europe? Thank you very much. What about ism and also positive steps? That's what he was talking about. He'd like to hear your responses. Right, uh, that was for the motion. Who's against the motion down? Anyone else up there? Are you for or against? Right, okay, microphone across, please, at high speed. And who is for the motion down here? Please, you'll come to you next, please. Uh, hello. Uh, yes. Marco from uh, Belgrade. Um, sorry to ask the question from this position. That's all right, we can see you. Um, um, I'm against the can motion. Can you turn the microphone up a bit, please? Yes. I'm against the motion uh, because it seems to me that there is this growing impression that uh, uh, Russian resources are basically limitless. I mean, I'll listen to some of the arguments here. Isn't the Russian economy reeling from the effects of the sanctions? Isn't no. your GDP going down? You can answer that. Aren't middle classes uh, uh, leaving? Russia in, in, in huge numbers. I mean, aren't you feeling the effects? This is my question. Thank, thank, thank you very you. much indeed. We will get an answer to that in the final remarks. Uh, you want to speak for, who else would like to speak? Any other hands going up? Speak, shout. Anyone else want to speak? Yes. Ah, okay, good. Forgive me, I'm asking you to speak because I can't see you. Right, get the microphone there. We're going to this gentleman first. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Vladimir Kobrin. I'm originally from Ukraine, and um, I'm for the motion. Uh, now, the, the Russian counterparts today, they were demanding facts and saying that uh, Russia basically seeks only mutual cooperation with the European Union. Uh, however, um, Russia uh, has invaded Georgia which they were closely cooperating with. They invaded... Keep going. Okay. Uh, they, uh, um, the, the Russian counterparts are saying that um, there is... Okay, the official Russian version is that there are no military... Russians military in Ukraine. However, uh, they make points that Russia should control the, the new, the rebels territory, which means they have influence over it. Uh, also, there was a notion about pro, uh, what's bad about protecting the Russian speakers in Ukraine. Well, I'm a Russian speaking, speaker and I'm originally from Western Ukraine, which is predominantly Ukrainian speaking. And, and there was no tension between Russian and Ukrainian speakers ever in that region. And the, West, the East and the South region, 
there was so much Russian speaking that there was hardly any Ukrainian. So I'm just saying that there are some facts and uh, because of these facts, uh, there are no guarantees that this conflict won't escalate further on. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Up there, please. Hi, oh, it's good. Uh, I'm against the motion. Uh, my name is Tiago, I'm from Portugal for two reasons. First of all, because in terms of all the Western states acknowledging uh, the Russian threat, seriously to Portugal and Spain, for example, there is no real threat coming from Russia. Even in terms of gas, our gas comes from Nigeria and Algeria. It doesn't come from Russia at all. So the threat to our public opinions, it's minimum. The impact of this uh, threat mentality is minimum. On the other hand, we already did this blame game on the 1990s, Russia, West, West, Russia. It didn't work out. Do we really want to go again into this blame game? Right, thank you very much. Anyone else want to speak? Uh, you've already spoken. Unless, unless you've changed your views he's, he's a professor, let him speak twice. Yeah, no, no, but... The... <laughs> Edward, there are rules to this game. There's a gentleman at the front. Sorry, it's not a game, it's a debate. Oh. Uh, no. the, blue, the blue mic, please. Yeah, it's live. It's working? No. It is. Yeah, okay. Uh, my name is Michal. I'm a local Bratislava uh, guy. Uh, <laughs> I originally You're Slovakian, in other yeah, words. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Slovak. I, I originally voted for the motion, but but uh, I was thinking about uh, the provocative flights of uh, fighters, uh, Russian fighter planes mm -hmm. in the Baltics, in the I I Iceland, and I think even in over Portugal. Um, so how can we interpret these these flights? Are they some kind of defensive measures uh, in the view that? Russia just wants to show off uh, its power and or or can there are they really some kind of preparation for for invasion of the Baltics or, or, or all right thank you right so Yevgeny and Ivan please respond it's your choice as to what you respond to or what you, you don't respond to is there anyone else uh, I don't see any other hands going up I don't want anyone to come to me at the end and say I was desperate to say something which was going to persuade the, the vote in a different direction. Right. In that case, I'm going to close the floor. Now, that means that I'm expecting you to vote. And this is going to be a slightly convoluted process. We have some boxes there. Um, you will know how you did it when you came in. Uh, and it's not going to be a secret vote, I have to say. That's the problem. Uh, what we want to do is for you to pass these boxes, both down here and up there, along very quickly, and then either put your card in the for or in the against. You should only have one card, and I'm sorry, there will be no independent invigilation here, um, and we don't have monitors of the whole process, um, and I don't want anyone to tell me that this was a rigged vote. It's very open and very public, and there are cameras in here. So get the, please get the boxes moving along quickly um, so people can make their choice. And as we do, and as you do, thank you, I'm going to ask for the final remarks two minutes each uh, from uh, each of the speakers in reverse order. Yevgeny, the floor yes. is yours for two yes. minutes. Yes. Unfortunately, it's uh, difficult for me to answer many of the questions sounded here, simply because I'm from a different sphere. It's difficult to judge. What I can tell you... Microphone, and please. My, can you... And that's my, personal, uh, that's my personal opinion. I blame all the three sides for the Ukrainian crisis. Russia, West, and Ukrainian political light. And that's, uh, not, 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 that cannot be seen, as I hear from many people here, as only a Russian problem. Unfortunately, again, as I speak to you, there is no proper law for states. And when states, uh, one state or a group of states do, do, do something, for example, which other group of states dislike, that creates a conflict. And no way to easily uh, resolve it. And uh, that's one uh, and very important uh, point. The second one, uh, to return to subvention. I really... Uh, do not think that Russia has really has enough power in order to subvent uh, European Union uh, or Eurozone, whatever. But, uh, but the opposite is right. Uh, European Union potentially, or at least the leaders of the European Union and the United States uh, have uh, enough power in order to subvent Russia, but they need your vote in order to be able to spend more money for that. <laughs> Because this is really an exhaustive play, and once, once it was already won, by this game it was already won. But uh, in a democratic regime, you have, you have to get approval from your uh, taxpayers in order to spend this money, irrespective of how you will create them. 
And that's an extremely important point, and what's, that's what I really feel and what I think as an economist. Uh, and what I can you about, uh, tell you about science, positive science, that may be the last no note here. Um, okay, no, not the last. There will be two last notes. Science. Uh, it's extremely difficult to stop if you feel you are on the front line. So when uh, it's like a Nash equilibrium, so when uh, uh, one side plays aggressive game, the other side will play aggressive too. And uh, the solution may be only either both sides stop uh, and that's, uh, that needs additional conditions to happen. Uh, or, for example, if one side will be uh, ready to lose, to sacrifice something in order uh, to come to a better solution for both. Uh, from my side, I really try to do my best internally in order not to make my government involved in this strange play, because I don't understand any benefits which could rise for my country uh, from this uh, confrontation. So do you see such benefits uh, for your countries? And the last one, uh, it was many times told again that um, how, for, uh, it was mentioned by the way, how Germany transformed from weak uh, democratic power into a strong totalitaristic regime. Yes, but I repeat my uh, initial remarks, it came through ideology. Ideological transformation doesn't take days, doesn't take weeks, and doesn't take months. It takes years, and it's clearly seen. So if you see such ideological transformation, then you may get some clues and reasons to think differently about right. Russian subvention. It's not, it's not present. Yes, thank you. Right, uh, the boxes are still going around. If you don't feel you've had a chance to put your note in, please make sure uh, you attract their attention whether up here or down there. George, the floor is yours for two minutes. Well, I've never said anything in my life in two minutes, including hello. But today's the first. Today's the first because I'm at Oxford. Let me simply say the essence of what I'm arguing. Russia must engage in aggressive policies. This is not because they're evil, not because they can stop it, not because they're worse than the West, the Russians are engaged in intelligence operations. So is the United States in different parts of the world. This is the human condition. The idea that somehow the creation of the European Union has brought peace to Europe was untrue. 100,000 people died in Yugoslavia, and the Europeans said, well, that didn't count. We live in a world of conflict. Russia is in that world. Russia has its national interests. And various debates on what is right and wrong may be satisfying, but not very useful. The invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968 was wrong. But it happened, and it defined a generation. We must become dispassionate in our analysis of the situation. We must put aside what we would like to see. We would like to stop imagining monsters. So it is altogether possible for me in this debate to say that Russia is a strategic threat, engaging in subversion of NATO and so on, and at the same time say, they are my enemy when they do this, but if I were them, I would do the same thing. And that is the complexity that's hard to say in two minutes. You did it very successfully. Thank you very much, George. <laughs> right. Uh, the last voice against the motion, Ivan, you have two minutes. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I will try to address the questions which were asked uh, first, uh, uh, the one uh, on provocative flights. Let me recall two recent episodes. Uh, the first one is the episode between Russian Su-27 and American spy intelligence uh, plane near the Russian border, near Kaliningrad uh, district. So my question is, what did American uh, plane uh, do there. So uh, wasn't it that flight provocative? And the second one is the episode between Russian Su-24 and American cruiser uh, in the Black Sea near the territorial uh, waters of Russia. My question is why that episode happened not in Mexican Gulf, but in Black Sea near the Russian naval border. So what, wh who is the provoke? Uh, though I agree that uh, the, the very fact of Berkmanship is quite dangerous and there is a threat of escalation. So Russia, both Russia and NATO need uh, communication and dialogue to avoid, uh, uh, let's say, accidents in this sphere. Georgia, 
Uh, let's uh, recall who started the, the war. Uh, do you remember this? <laughs> Any questions? So Russian peace, peacekeepers were attacked. Uh, some of them perished. Afterwards, Russia reacted to, uh, to, to force Georgia for, for, for peace. So uh, again, the, 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 the whole thing was, uh, was not good for our relations with the West and for Georgia especially. But uh, <laughs> at least Russian, at least Russia was not the only uh, stakeholder there uh, in starting that war. Uh, uh, Czechoslovakia, well, uh, it's a good question, and personally, I condemn this film. Uh, and uh, if you um, if you apply to Russian official position and to the opinion of the majority of Russia, they strongly condemn 1968. This is this is very clear for Russian both on unofficial and official level, what is, what is even more important. The official position is very clear about 1968. It was clear in the beginning of 1990s, and it uh, didn't change. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Last point, please. Uh, uh, yeah, and motivation for Ukraine. This is very, uh, for, for Crimea and Ukraine, uh, Russian motivation. Uh, that's a crucial question. Uh, the Russian, uh, the way things went, uh, last year was a total surprise for all of the Russian expert community. So you mean, you mean the seizure of Crimea? Yeah, uh, the Crimea and, uh, and the, the, uh, the whole thing. So that was a, a big surprise for everyone. So that was not a part of the strategy. That was an abrupt tactical decision. And the key motivation was the security one. So the security concern and security interest uh, is central. There, there is a fear, an old fear in Russian political elite that uh, Ukraine may drift to NATO. And the revolution in Ukraine gave, uh, let's say, a ground for and an argument that Ukraine will soon jo join the alliance, which is perceived as a, as a military danger. All right, Ivan, your time is up. Yep, Thank you thanks. very much indeed. You've heard uh, both speakers now against the motion. Finally, uh, Ed Lucas, two minutes for you, uh, the last voice for the motion. If you rewrite history, you're also rewriting the rules which govern the present and the future. Um, it's shocking to me that, that I watched all of that film. I felt nauseated watching it. Um, I'm glad that Russia hasn't officially changed its position in 1968, but I do notice Vladimir Putin justifying the molotov ribbentrop Pact. I notice other voices saying the attack on Finland was justified. Once you justify preemptive attack in the past, you start justifying it in the present. Secondly, this debate about strong or weak is not, I think, the, the fundamental one. Russia's doing this not because it's strong, not because it's weak, it's doing it because it can. It can because it has capabilities which we can't respond to. In particular, Russia is willing to accept economic pain in a way we are not willing to accept economic pain, and they're willing to accept risk in a way that we are not able to accept risk. We are not losing this, and we are losing it. We are not losing this because we're weak. We're losing this because our willpower is weak. We are still living in this era of wishful thinking where, for example, we think that Russia's not a threat to Spain. Read the, read the report by your investigating magistrate about Russian organized crime in Spain, where he says this goes to the heart of the integrity of the Spanish state because of Russian organized crime's ability to bribe prosecutors, bribe magistrates, bribe civil servants. It's a threat in Spain just like everywhere else. And it's the same wishful thinking which says that sanctions are going to take care of it and the low oil price is going to take care of it. It's not. Don't rely on a deus ex machina to come and sort this out. We have to sort it out and we have to plan to base our assumptions, to answer your very good point, base your assumptions on the worst case and then if that turns out not to be the case, then you're happy. Don't do what we've been doing, which is to live in la-la land and then be caught terrified and helpless when it turns out that the La La Land assumptions are wrong. Ed, Ed Lucas, thank you very much indeed. Right, you've heard all the arguments for and against and a very uh, balanced series of uh, interventions from the floor. What I'm waiting for is a piece of paper to head in my direction. Uh, do you have it? Excellent, thank you very much indeed. I'm going to look at it first. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. I've got some more votes here if you need. No, you haven't. <laughs> this is not that kind of election, Edward. <laughs> this is an open, transparent um, uh, vote, let me tell you. 
Now, is there anyone out there who'd like to just share with us why they may have changed their view during this debate? I'm not, asking, I'm not putting you on the spot, but if there's anyone who would like to share that, it would be very useful. Otherwise, I'm going to tell you uh, what the vote is. Uh, I'm going to tell you now what, you do, your, what all of you, and I've, I've seen one or two people come in, but I think by and large all of you are still here, uh, who are here right at the beginning. Um, the vote at the beginning for the motion that NATO and EU member states in Western Europe must assume Russia will work to subvert them, including using military force, was for the motion 64%, against the motion 36%. So it was roughly uh, two to one. The result, uh, it, after hearing an hour and a half of debate, is this. Uh, for the motion, 72%, against the motion 28%. Ooh, so the vote has shifted in that direction. I'm the impartial adjudicator here. Thank you very much indeed for all four of, to all four of you for some very, very sharp interventions and clarity on the arguments. Thank you very much indeed. Congratulations to them. And um, I should, I guess, uh, express commiserations that you didn't convince large numbers to move the debate in your direction. But I'd be interested, uh, if you want to afterwards, what you think of this as an experiment, whether you enjoyed it, whether you felt it's brought out uh, a large amount of issues which maybe you weren't thinking about before. But can I thank you all very much indeed? Thank you, Ed. Thank you very much indeed. Careful.